Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. This is a good news story for everybody in St. Louis. German museums want collections as good as ours. If everybody does a little bit, then together we can change the world. Today on Spotlight, an exhibit showcasing the works of 17 German artists. What this show can teach you about history. Plus, the Regional Arts Commission launches a major study measuring the impact of the arts in our region. And then scientists study the correlation between COVID and heart disease, what their findings tell us. But first, meet one of the artists showcased at the Art Museum, why his work turned dark in the 1930s. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Inside the St. Louis Art Museum is an exhibit like no other. I need everyone to know that we have one of the largest collections of Max Beckmann's art in the world. In the world. Um, German museums want collections as good as ours. Max Beckmann is one of the most notable names in modern art, and he has a close personal relationship with St. Louis. And if you come to the museum, you'll always see works by Beckmann. You'll see this beautiful gallery that's hung with some of his largest scale figural works, right? But what's on view is only half of the paintings that we have in the collection. St. Louis Art Museum curator Melissa Venator knows all about Beckmann. She has a research background in 20th century German art and is charged with setting up exhibitions like this one. You have this really special opportunity to get a sense of the full arc of his career. And, you know, within the museum, it's very rare that we can do that for any single artist. How the art museum became the custodian of such a vast collection is as interesting a story as the artist himself. His popularity dates back to the 1920s with more realistic oils of current events and living people, like this one, Titanic. But through much of his career, he was labeled an expressionist, a description he despised. So he was very clear in his lifetime that he was not an expressionist. And I think that really confuses a lot of people because especially when you look at the art that he made in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, it bears all the hallmarks that we think of when we think of expressionist painting. So what do I mean by that? Abstract shapes and forms, bright colors, strong outlines. Venator acknowledges Beckmann's work turned dark after World War I, reflecting his mindset following his experiences as a medic in the field. His work day in and day out was to transport dead and dying soldiers, and that created a traumatic experience for him. And a lot of these very tortured figures that you see in his paintings first appear at that time. In the 1930s, as World War II approached, Beckmann's work continues with dark outlines, mirroring what was happening around him in Germany. It's highlighting that surreality, and that kind of opens a window into his thinking on the cusp of what was a very difficult time for him personally, and also world historically with the rise of, of the Nazi party. Adolf Hitler himself tried to make a living as an artist before he rose to power, and his views spilled into politics. The Nazis confiscated works by Beckmann and other famous artists from Van Gogh to Picasso. And at an historic art show in July 1937, their works, along with Beckmann's, went on display as degenerate art at the so-called Shame Exhibition. It was a worldview that saw modern art as vulgar and a threat to German identity. Some of Beckmann's works, like those of other affected artists, were sold for foreign currency to other countries, while others were destroyed. However, Beckmann had already grasped what lay ahead and had emigrated to Amsterdam with his wife the day before the exhibition. So certainly many of Beckmann's works were lost during the Nazi era due to confiscation and destruction or loss. However, because he had the foresight to really bring his studio contents with him, first to Amsterdam and then to the United States, it remained intact for the most part. Still exiled in Amsterdam, the end of the war gives Beckmann an opportunity to reestablish his connections in the United States. 
He's then invited to teach at the School of Fine Arts at Washington University here in St. Louis and did so from 1947 until 1949. So his arrival in St. Louis was the start of a chain of events that led to this collection. And one of the big links in that chain, especially in terms of our fantastic paintings, was this fantastic individual named Morton D. May, who St. Louisans will know through famous bar department stores. The department store mogul had been casually collecting art and was introduced to Beckman's work. He purchases a painting at a New York gallery by Beckman in 1948, and then is so interested in him that he commissions Beckman to paint his portrait in 1949 as a way to finally meet Beckman. May just became committed to building what became the largest collection of paintings by Max Beckman in the world and did so in order to give it to this museum. And May delivered on his promise. Beckmann's exhibition is one of the few displayed chronologically, beginning with a rare bust of the artist himself, who is known for his self-portraits, usually on canvas. We do have some really fun paintings that he made here in St. Louis, and this is one of them. And you know he made it in St. Louis. You know, in 49, he could have been in New York. He spent part of the year here and part of the year in New York. But you know he made it in St. Louis, because down there below his signature, you see STL. But he kind of famously assigned still lifes as the first assignment that he gave all of his students at Washington University. Before Beckman leaves to teach in New York, St. Louis holds the first American retrospective of Beckman's art in 1948. Beckman was always excited um, to see these big shows of his work, and I think it's important to understand he hadn't seen a lot of these paintings for decades. He returns in 1950 to receive an honorary degree from Wash U. That same year, the 66-year-old artist is walking to his second retrospective of his life's work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Tragically, he collapses and dies from a heart attack, never getting to experience it. But his work lives on through the art museum's latest display, a paper exhibition entitled Day and Dream in Modern Germany. It runs through February 26th. When you think of the St. Louis Art Museum, both nationally and internationally, a lot of people think of our fantastic collection of modern and post-war German art. And in some ways, it had its source here with our Beckmann collection. We're here at the St. Louis Art Museum, looking at the exhibition Day and Dream in Modern Germany, 1914 to 1945. The exhibition features prints, drawings, and photographs that were made in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. It features 17 artists, and they really range from the very figurative to the very abstract, really showing the world of art that was made in Germany in the early 20th century. The title of the exhibition was inspired by a portfolio of lithographs made by Max Beckmann in 1946. He lived and taught here in St. Louis from 1947 to 1949, and he was also one of the most successful painters in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Now, we're very fortunate here in St. Louis that we happen to have one of the largest collections of Beckmann's art in the world. And so, while there are 17 artists in the exhibition, we've included a lot of works by Max Beckmann, including the portfolio Day and Dream. Some other artists I'd really encourage you to look at here in the exhibition one of them is Keta Kolwitz, who was the first woman admitted to the Prussian Art Academy in 1919 with the founding of the Weimar Republic. She produced some absolutely fantastic and very moving prints that document the plight of the working poor in Berlin in the wartime years. Another artist is Walter Gramate. The museum was fortunate to receive a major gift of works from Walter Gramate's estate in 2019, right before the pandemic. So here in this exhibition, we have these intense psychological portraits that made Gramate famous in his own day, where the psychology of the sitter is written in the lines on the face. And a last artist that I would really encourage you to look at is Olga Zander. He's represented in the exhibition by five photographs, 
all of which were taken as part of his life's work to document all of German society. I think not everyone knows about World War I, that when it ended, it also brought the end of the German Empire, which had been ruled by the Kaisers. And when Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated, what replaced him was the first German Democratic Republic. Now, after World War I, all of Europe was in shambles, and the democracy that the Weimar Republic offered, including the first constitutional rights, equality of women, invited artists from across Europe to come to Germany, where they finally had the freedom to produce the art that they wanted to. So the exhibition is free, and when you come, do bring your phone with you because we have an online audio guide um, that offers really incredible insights into several of the major works in the show. You can also access it from home too. The exhibition closes on February 26th, and you can learn more about it at our website, slam.org. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Today we have gathered more than 200 arts organization leaders to celebrate the launch of our Arts and Economic Prosperity Study number six. This is the study where we capture the economic value of the arts and culture sector in the St. Louis region. So right here, you know, in St. Louis, so what I'm here talking about is Arts and Economic Prosperity, which is a national economic impact study of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and our community arts programs. And my job is to make sure everyone's got the information tools they need to make the case for the arts. More funding from businesses, from government, more favorable arts policy, like making sure the arts, you know, here in St. Louis keep getting a percentage of that hotel tax. Ask any legislator what their three priorities are, they'll tell you, jobs, jobs, and jobs. And so what we're doing with this economic impact study is connecting arts and culture to those priorities using the research. And then what that hopefully will do is those legislators will understand, oh, this is providing not just cultural benefits, but also economic benefits. This study is the one that you hear quoted, $600 million in economic activity, 19,000 jobs, 12 million people come to our community for arts and culture. So it demonstrates how arts and culture makes a difference in our economic development and how we are ensuring that not only people are having a good time, but our cities are thriving. Once everybody supplies all that information, then in Americans for the Arts and our economists and everybody, we turn all that survey data you know, into economic impact findings. And so in September of 2023, we'll deliver a report to the Regional Arts Commission about the economic impact of the arts in the St. Louis region during 2022. And then we encourage people to use these data to tell the story about their organizations and their impact on the community. Arts organizations in our community can use this study for their board members, for their patrons, for their staff to understand the impact that they're having. Many of our creatives like to focus on the art that they're making, but what's amazing about our community, the arts and culture community, is that we're making an economic difference. And to tell patrons, when you support this theater, when you support this museum, when you support this festival, you're supporting jobs, you're supporting your neighbors. And being able to put numbers to the story is really important, and this study does that. We are working with organizations like the Regional Arts Commission to really dig deep into the community to find where is the art happening? Where is that social impact work? Where are the artists intersecting with the community? So that makes this the most comprehensive, the most inclusive survey of its kind so far. We want to diversify RAC's revenue funds. So we currently get 98% of our revenue from hotel motel sales tax. And while it has gotten better since 2020, it is certainly not at pre-pandemic levels. And so we need to be able to communicate to our elected officials at the federal, state, and local level that RAC needs support within their budget and also to other sources of funding, be they private foundations or individuals, because when RAC is hurting, the sector is hurting. And so we can't afford 
afford to wait for the economics to recover from just tourism alone, we've got to find other ways to generate revenue so that we can continue to power this sector. When we invest in the arts, we're not investing in some black hole of goodness. You know, we're investing in an industry that gives back to the community, jobs and government revenue. You know, the research shows the arts provide both cultural and economic benefits. And everybody benefits, you know, this is, we're not just talking about, oh, this is great just for artists, or oh, this is great just for arts organizations. This is a good news story for everybody in St. Louis. To learn more, visit RACSTL.org. A nonprofit mentoring young black men later on Spotlight. So we started early on in the pandemic, you know, thinking about what can we do to pitch in and help in the fight against COVID-19. And at that time, we did not even know that long COVID existed. We just needed no knew that the house is on fire. We needed to all pitch in to sort of help put the fire out. Without even realizing how far the flames had spread, Dr. Ziad Al-Ali became that first responder, jumping into long COVID research. He's the chief of research and development at the Veterans Affairs St. Louis Healthcare System and a clinical epidemiologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Among his post-COVID concerns, heart conditions after COVID-19. We started getting reports from a lot of patients that they're having heart problems, chest pain, arrhythmias, basically abnormal heart rhythm, et cetera, et cetera. So we decided to take a comprehensive look at the cardiovascular manifestations of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So Dr. Al-Ali and his colleagues conducted an extensive study. I went into this project thinking that we're going to find that people who had high risk factors for cardiovascular disease, people who smoked a lot, people who had high rates of obesity, you know, people who had high cholesterol or people who had family history of heart problems. You know, I thought that these people, if they got COVID-19, COVID-19 is gonna push them over the edge, manifest with high risk of cardiovascular problems. The research began by diving into the vast de-identified database maintained by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. It's the nation's largest integrated health care delivery system. The data set covered the months of March of 2020 through January 2021, involving more than 150,000 people with COVID-19. Compared to control groups that are together more than 10 million people. After the analysis of federal health data, what he found was not what he had expected. What we found it did not matter if you were young or old. It did not matter if you had prior history of cardiovascular disease. It did not matter if you smoked or not. It did not matter if you had obesity or not. All these groups, regardless whether they had high risk of cardiovascular disease or not, they still, whenever, whenever they got exposed to COVID-19, they still manifested with increased risk of cardiovascular problems. Really, nobody is really spared the adverse consequences of having COVID-19 infection. He explains COVID-19 infection increases the risk of heart disease by nearly 5%. With single digit 5% of people with COVID-19 will get long COVID or have gotten long COVID. That translates to millions of people in the U.S. and many, many, many more around the world. And that increased risk of developing cardiovascular complications happens within the first month to a year after infection. Even if you're asymptomatic or have very, very, very mild symptoms, you're definitely not out of the woods. We see a lot of people who are asymptomatic. They didn't even know they had COVID-19. They did not even know they had it. They did not know they had it. And, and then, you know, they, like, you know, weeks later, they're like, oh, like uh, this profound unexplained fatigue or brain fog or heart problems. Such complications include disruptive heart rhythms, inflammation of the heart, blood clots, stroke, coronary artery disease, heart attack, heart failure, even death. Overall, those infected with COVID-19 were 55% more likely than those without COVID-19 to suffer a major adverse cardiovascular event, which includes heart attack, stroke, and death. The study does not include data involving Delta and Omicron variants. So we don't really know if the newer ones, you know, like Omicron is associated with less risk of long COVID. Chances are that it might be. Al-Ali is now tackling this as well. We are looking at long-term consequences of having pre-Delta, Delta, Delta and, and Omicron and now actually BA5. 
In another study, Dr. Al-Ali helped prove vaccinations reduce the chances for long COVID by 15 percent, which helps, but he says long COVID is still a problem for the vaccinated. Besides the heart, long COVID conditions have a wide range of health problems. It's not a small problem. It's not a trivial problem. It affects anywhere between 5 to 30 percent of the people who got COVID-19 in the first place. So it's a serious problem. It is real and we need to definitely address it. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys, Tellys, Natoas, Auroras, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We are looking back at Webster Arts' first Chalk Fest that was held in Old Webster Business District. We invited members of the community to get a space and bring their creativity to participate in a chalk fest. It's pretty simple. You need chalk, you need a kneeler or some sort of cushion to protect your knees while you're down on the pavement. And then you can bring some other tools you may have at home like a chalkboard eraser or cloth or even a paintbrush mixed with water so you can blend your colors and really make some different tones and shades while you work. So at Webster Arts, we love to think of some events that can engage the whole family. So kids and adults can participate at the same time. We know that kids love arts and they love a hands-on experience. And so this is a great way to get them engaged and not have to worry if you're a professional artist, you're a talenter, always welcome. We invited professional artist Craig Thomas, who's actually out of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, to come and also do a piece that the community could really actually engage with. So he created an illusion of a hole in the street with a landscape and a bridge to cross over the hole. It was a piece of artwork that the community could actually like stand on and get their picture taken. It's very important for the community to come out and, and uh, to participate in the uh, cultural aspects of these festivals. I mean, they're fun, first of all. They're interactive and it brings people together in a, a new uh, social way. The Webster Arts Chalk Fest 2022 will take place October 1st. Visit webster-arts.org slash chalkfest2022 for more info. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I need gentlemen... You guys are going to go in and sit down and get ready for the lab, right? STEM lab? Um, I'm going to need you guys. The Village is a community service organization, but the heart and soul of what we do is we mentor young black males ages 6 to 18. I was in education for 20 years, and during that time, I realized that there was more that the community needed. I realized that there was more than I as an individual could do. What we do is we provide real life experiences. We believe that experience is the master teacher. We believe that they just had a chance to experience the possibilities of what life brings that uh, from what we've seen that they naturally will choose their path and pick a direction that's healthy. My name is Grant Williams. I'm 12 years old. I really like doing everything, meeting up with people, having fun, and doing some work and helping people. My name is Dwayne, and I'm 11 years old. Why I also come to the village is so they can help you get like your grades up and hey, be respectful to your parents. We just provide that space for them to be curious, for them to make mistakes, to, to burn their energy, and so parents love us. So I joined the village because my sons are coming home telling me about the village, which is this program and these men 
and this guy Keenan who was, you know, teaching them certain things, taking them certain places. So me being a father I am, I wanted to investigate. And uh, I came in and investigated the program. I, I definitely loved Keenan and what he was doing, his passion for the kids. But I also saw a need and uh, decided to step in that role. I like dealing with the kids who have the most constraints, the boys who don't uh, have structure at home that come here and pour out and look out for those things. To have somebody to say they believe in you and also show up every other weekend to, to show you they believe in you, uh, that we don't know everything bad about you, so we only treat you based off what we see. There are so many ways to participate in the village. We're always looking for donations. We're always looking for volunteers. Mentoring is not about the child. You know, the learning is both ways. You know what I like the most about the work? It's one thing to know that you'll help the young men gain certain experiences, right? But the other part of it is that as the mentors, we're experiencing things as well. So like just an example, we did kayaking on the Mississippi River. No one, and I mean absolutely no one, could have paid me to believe that I'll be riding any little thin boat in the middle of the muddy Mississippi River. But when I seen these young dudes, six, seven, eight years old, even though I'm trembling on the inside, I said, you know what, I'm gonna get out there anyway. These second and fourth Saturdays of each month is truly a journey. We're asking for donations of, of irons and ironing boards so that we can teach the boys how to iron. We're asking for donations for toiletries so we can teach them how to groom themselves to make them more independent. So this is just the first step in the long process of building self-esteem and, and so that they can find that intrinsic motivation to be successful. The blueprint that we're laying out now uh, the goal is for it to be duplicated outside of the St. Louis area because we know that we are truly one of the best solutions to the issues of our at-risk youth in St. Louis. We help some people in need and we feed people that's in need and we just help people in general and we do some fun stuff at the end of it. Our goal is to fill in whatever necessary gaps within every household so that the next generation can be raised healthy, whole, and have the same access to resources and uh, learning opportunities and experiences um, across the board. The motto of the village is that if everybody does a little bit, then together we can change the world. Looking for more stories to inspire children to make a difference in their community? Check out our educational website, educate.today. Use the keywords, making a difference. Next week, the Shaw Art Fair celebrates its 30th anniversary. Plus, the race to find the Titanic after it sank. A new book tells us a story most don't know. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.